thank you all for coming today. I understand it's quite a trip for some people, but thank you all for being here, and it's good to be back. Uh, today is a, a presentation on a resource I've been working on for about four or five months now. Um, I've had a blog that's been active for about six or seven years. It's gone through some different transformations, but, and in a way this is like a successor to it, almost like a new version. Uh, but before I start talking about that, I want to uh, go back to my childhood, actually. I, I, I promise this is relevant. Uh, this is the elementary school I went to, and in the fourth grade we were learning how to do algebra. Okay, so this was a new topic for me. I'd done pretty well with everything until then, you know, spelling was no problem, basic arithmetic was okay. But algebra was new terminology, new symbols, more abstract. I didn't really feel like I was getting it. Wasn't doing really well in the quizzes either. So one day I, I said to my teacher, Mrs. Harmon, uh, Mrs. Harmon, I'm just not getting this. I don't understand. I've done all the exercises. I paid attention in class, but I'm, I'm, I just don't get it. And she thought for a second, and then she said, I just, just keep trying it. I mean, you'll, you'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> which isn't exactly what a fourth grader wants to hear. Uh, eventually I did figure it out, but in the back of my mind I thought that this probably took a lot more time than it should have. Maybe there was a different approach that could have been a little bit easier and a little bit less torturous. So a more recent example, which is a little bit closer to the point, is when I started learning fMRI analysis. And this was when I was a lab manager back at Ohio State University. Now I had no background in programming. I had no background in fMRI. I was just starting out, but we were using a package called AFNI. It was one of the major three fMRI analysis packages in addition to SPM and FSL. And AFNI is notorious for having a steep learning curve. It's very heavily driven from the command line. You need to be very fluent with it to get any use out of it, but once you do, it's a very useful tool. And while I was working there, uh, I'm not going to name names, but I'll, we'll call him Ted. Okay, I, I was talking to Ted one day, a professor, and you know, I'm trying to learn this pretty much on my own, and I'm coming up across this term called a beta weight, right? And I don't, I don't know what a beta weight is, but it keeps coming up in the documentation. It seems to be really important. Everybody's talking about it, and during presentations and meetings, I'm just kind of like, you know, nodding along, like I know what, it, what they mean, but I actually don't. So I asked Ted, what is a beta weight? I don't get this. I'm studying it a lot. It's just not clicking. And Ted thinks for a second, and he goes, that's really complicated. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Which, on the one hand, was kind of a relief because, oh, maybe that's something really abstruse, like in any field. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to know how the motor of your car works to actually drive it, so maybe I don't need to know about that. But I had the feeling I was being fobbed off by an explanation a little bit too easy. And later on, I came across this animation on the AFNI website. Uh, and this describes something called deconvolution, which is tied up with the concept of a beta weight. So I, I came across this animation describing how convolution, how different so-called hemodynamic response functions or bold responses convolve over time. So you'll see these two things. It's almost like a moving average of these different HRFs. You can see in the blue curve there. And I saw other ones describing also how beta weights actually work, how these things are then scaled to fit the actual data that you collect. And so then I began, I began annotating them uh, for my own edification also to show other people. But for example, if this gray line is this observed messy signal that you see in your data, then these HRFs that you plunk wherever there's an onset, you scale them up and down to best fit the data. And the amount that you scale them is this beta weight. That's the number that you then submit to a higher level analysis. So just something like that made it a lot more intuitive, a lot easier to understand, and not so inaccessible. That was my first introduction to thinking about a new way of teaching this rather than just reading the manuals, supplementing them with animations, and showing how these more complex abstract concepts play out over time. And also brought to mind a problem. So I don't think that I'm a unique case. 
how do people learn fMRI analysis in the first place? Well, for me, it was mostly on my own. I was a lab manager. I wasn't a student or anything like that. But part of my job did have to do with data analysis, so I did need to catch on as quickly as I could. But for those who are, say, graduate students or maybe postdocs who are just trying to learn something like fMRI, here are the most obvious options that spring to mind. One is to take a course. And if you're lucky enough, the course happens to occur at a good time for you. You're able to attend it. You know that the lecture is very good. You've heard good reviews about it. It's useful. You know that the ideas will stick even after you are outside of the course. Uh, the second one is to go to a workshop. Okay. Uh, sometimes there's kind of a hybrid between the two. In a couple of weeks, we're teaching the fMRI course. It starts August 5th. It's a two-week long course. It's almost like a, a really compressed semester long course. Has anybody gone to that? I think a few of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most workshops that I've seen for things like you know AFNI, FSL, more specialized things like Free Surfer, they're about three days to a week, roughly. So there are different gradations of that. But there are a couple of drawbacks to both of these that I want to point out, especially for beginners or newcomers. One is the course or the workshop may not be offered at the right time. Right? It could just be that there's a scheduling conflict, or in the case of a workshop, it's during a time of the year that it's just not going to work for you. If you have a wedding to attend, there's a family issue that comes up. You're going to be somewhere else, and it's just not going to work out. The second thing is sometimes the courses and the workshops, or well, the workshops in particular, uh, can be expensive to attend. The registration rates can vary from something like, you know, four or five hundred dollars to over a thousand dollars. It doesn't include travel, it doesn't include hotels. So this doesn't always work for everybody, even if you do get a travel grant. And the third thing, just to scare people away, is if you're going to go to a workshop or take a longer course somewhere outside of the university, sometimes you have to apply, you have to write a cover letter, an application. And lo and behold, you sometimes need some basic understanding of what they're going to teach for them to accept you, which seems like a catch-22. It's not totally fair, right? But they have a reason for that. It's not a remedial course. They got to assume some foundational knowledge because people want just not to learn the basics, but some more advanced things as well. But for the person who is absolutely new, this poses a serious problem because you can't get into it. And I couldn't get into one the first couple of years that I was trying to learn fMRI. The third one, which can occur in tandem with these other ones, is to learn online. That's what I've been involved in for the past you know, six years or so. And this is fine, but it's also very scattershot, um, especially if you don't really know what question you're trying to ask. It's not a very systematic approach. You just kind of find things here and there. Um, one pitfall that I'll point out, just because it comes to mind recently, uh, there's some people in a lab back at the psychology building over in East Hall, where they were using a blog post I wrote a, a long time ago when I, when I first started it about cluster correction. It was actually not entirely correct. So these things aren't peer reviewed. You know, they do get corrected if some people can point out what things may need to be rectified, but you still run that risk. Another thing that comes to mind is if you're just learning things in bits and snippets, it's hard to kind of put everything together into a comprehensible whole. Uh, I'm reminded of a scene in there's a, this book, The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. There's a journalist. He has to write about uh, Chinese metaphysics. So he looks up China, and he looks up metaphysics, and then he just combines the two, which doesn't <laughs> actually work. So you also run that risk as well. You need to know how to integrate everything specifically as it applies to your case. OK. So as you know, the, the style of how I was teaching this evolved, I just want to give a couple examples of how this worked. Uh, but first, let me kind of go through the goals that I had in mind while I was doing this. One is, OK, so if we can create animations to explain more complex topics, that's great. But we also need to show people how to actually do the steps. Because you can know all the theory that you want, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't actually know how to do it. Right? 
And this, I think, is the drawback of a lot of textbooks that are out there. I mean, you could, you could read, say, the, the, the Huddle intro to fMRI, which is a great theoretical background. You understand how it works. You get a sense of how people do certain pre-processing steps and what they do. But when it comes to actually opening up something like SPM or FSL, you, you don't have any idea what you actually need to type, what you actually need to do. So why not combine the two? so that people can both remember the actual steps and then be able to apply the concepts to new scenarios. Okay, so what I'll show you in a second is an example of some screencasts I've been doing recently and how I combine these two uh, pieces of information. So here's an example. Uh, again, this is a, a video. Usually it would have some voiceover. I'm just going to kind of walk through it so you know, some things go by a little bit quickly, but just uh, try to bear with me. This was part of a, a talk that I gave at NYU last year, and they requested uh, you know, an intro ROI analysis in FSL, or AFNI. And so to begin with, we start with a conceptual overview. What are we dealing with? What do these things look like? Well, they're kind of like these giant Rubik's cubes composed of smaller cubes, which are voxels. Think of each one of these things as like one of your contrast maps that you're extracting from. And all the ROI analysis does is it selects a subset of voxels, chisels them out, and then within each voxel you have a single number representing, say, a contrast estimate. It could be condition A minus condition B, for example. And then you simply sum up all of the values over that ROI, get one number. You do that same procedure for each subject in your data set, and then you run a t-test on all those values. Did you make that? Yeah, that was photoshopped. It was for a punchline during the actual talk. No, I mean the, oh, the oh, the animation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, but the, the actual journal title was sure. something I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just photoshopped that in there. Uh, that was amazing. Oh, thank you. So, um, so as we're going through this, you'll see that, okay, we talk a little bit about the conceptual part of it. Then we actually go through what you need to type out. You know, as we go through this, we'll be highlighting certain things that I want the viewer or the student to focus on. And if we need to, we can uh, you know, do some highlights for certain terms and concepts that they need to pay attention to. So for example, you know, and also they'd be given a sample data set to work with. And we would type out something like this. And then as this gets typed out, we take a step back, we take a little breath of air, and we unpack exactly what each part of this command does. It's very easy to just get people to type in or click on certain buttons, but to actually explain what's happening makes it a lot easier to then apply this to whatever data set that you're using, with the end goal being you can then apply it to your own data set. I think the very last part of this is then checking, again, to make sure that it actually created the thing that you wanted. So in this case, we created something in the right, you know, roughly the right motor cortex area. Just make sure that it actually is where it should be. And then the final product is we do that for all the subjects, get one number per subject, and then you can analyze that in your statistical software of choice. In this case, yes, indeed, in the right motor cortex, left button presses give you more activation than right button presses. Simple example, but use it as a surrogate for whatever contrast you are using. So I've gone through all of this as a prelude to you know, what, what the, the main attraction is for today because uh, I wanted to give you kind of a sense in how I'm thinking about this and how I'm developing this new tool that I'm using. It's under development pretty much constantly. I keep making updates and edits. So the more insight you have into how I'm thinking about it, if you have any ideas you have, because this is something that you could actually make edits for and requests, um, We'll be on the same page about that. So everything I've talked about so far, <coughs> this is kind of my philosophy for how I'm trying to teach this, uh, comes into something called production values. Now, when I use that phrase, it has probably a slightly negative connotation. You think Hollywood, you think flash and trash, you think just you know, trying to dazzle people with you know, some BS with not a lot of substance. Fair enough. But I'm trying to approach this from a slightly different perspective in that if people are going to be learning fMRI analysis or diffusion or MVPA anyway, why not make the package as accessible as possible? So here are a few things that fall into that. One is it needs to be concise. 
right? So especially in the past few years, I've tried to really pare down the length of any individual video that I put up on YouTube to supplement these blog posts that I write, the documentation. It's very rare for anything to be more than, say, seven minutes. Usually around five, six minutes is a good ballpark. That's entirely based on my own subjective experience with, I don't like watching videos that are longer than that on YouTube. So why not try to get it down to a certain size, which is digestible, just as a, an individual chunk. And also, um, if, if, I don't know, if you've been following what I've been doing for, since I've started, you'll notice that it's actually become more scripted. It's by design. I type these things out. I edit them. And I try to get them down to a relatively short length, but not oversimplified. Something that's tied up with that is also just making sure that the audio and the video is good, right? Is it understandable? Can you actually see what I'm writing on the screen? Okay, it could be like a fantastic tutorial, in my opinion. But if you can't see it, if you can't understand what I'm saying, if it's inaudible, or if it just doesn't look appealing, you're, you're going to be distracted, you're going to be turned off, and you're probably not going to be as focused as you should be on the content and the meaning of what I'm saying. And from the conciseness part of this, <clears throat> we, we can create a series of videos if we have to tackle more complex topics. Something like a start to finish tutorial on FSL, which I'll show you in just a second, obviously can't be encapsulated in five minutes. It just is not possible. On the other hand, it's also really uh, off-putting, I would say, to then see uh, like a two-hour chunk or four hours or whatever and not have any idea when in this particular you know, epic they're going to cover the topic that you specifically want to focus on right now. All this boils down to is whenever we're making something to help somebody learn something like fMRI, let's make it convenient. It doesn't mean easy. It doesn't mean condescending to anybody. It just means try to remove as many obstacles as you can to the understanding of the reader or the viewer, as it may be. Even if they're not going to completely understand it in the first go, that's totally understandable. I wouldn't expect anybody to. At least make it so that there's no possible way that they can misunderstand what you're saying. That's a very, very important point. If you think that I'm a little too focused on the, the details and nitty-gritty, I'd just like to show a couple examples side by side. If you were to see something like this to try to learn how to do SPM, for example, I think this is hideous. I may be kicking this person while they're down. This was made probably 15 years ago. It's been around for a long time, probably being made in GeoCities or something. But I mean, just on the first look of it, blue background, I, I don't like that at all, especially in low lit environments. Uh, the fact that the formatting you know, is pretty small, I'm, I'm doing a little bit injustice by placing it up on a screen like this. But even so, if it's on your particular screen, you know, your eye gets tired even before you reach the very end of the screen. There's just little things like that add up over time. And also, the way it's written, it's just, you know, going step by step by step through every possible option that you see in the GUI. And it gives the, the sense of simply adding one thing to another instead of actually organizing an idea or a thought, which is something far different. So let me show you. This is an example from a woman named Marlene Tejero. This was uh, an introductory tutorial made by her, uh, I think, last fall. But the MR Tricks people liked it so much, they actually put it up on their main page. Uh, I think she just made this out of her own volition. Uh, nobody you know, paid her to do it. She just wanted to create it. But you can see already that you know, the, the way that it's, there's a pretty clear organization structure to it, uh, just simple things like header, fonts that clearly set out things from each other. And as I'm scrolling through here pretty quickly, she color codes things, uh, maybe not too apparent on this screen right here, but certain text box marked in blue represent one thing, certain text box marked in gray represent another thing to keep you organized. And so this kind of approach I find a lot more appealing. So again, this isn't a video. There aren't animations. But for an actual PDF, it's very, very good. 
she writes out what the different steps do. She shows you exactly what you should be typing with this example data set that she provides. And then she explains what these figures mean, what the results actually mean, and how you can interpret it. Um, also, there's another example here. And it's just organized in a, in a very pleasant to read fashion. But also, just the, the way that it's written as well, for example, uh, she's starting to talk about something called a fiber orientation density. And given what you've read so far, she points out, you know, however, in white matter, we'd expect anisotropic diffusion, so why do we see a spherical shape here? Simple things like that where you have an awareness of the reader and you're asking things like, well, isn't, isn't that right? You know, what, what, what do you think about that? It's much more engaging and you actually, uh, it exercises your powers of trying to comprehend it a little bit more. Okay. So one more slide before I get to the highly anticipated brain book. Okay, so everything I've talked about so far, why don't, I just, why don't I just keep doing that? Why don't I just keep making videos, writing blog posts? It's been going pretty well so far. People seem you know, to, to find it useful. Why not just keep doing that? Fair enough, and I would have no problem doing that as well. But since I've been here, how to accommodate dozens of labs spread across three campuses? It's a lot of people, a lot of different areas of study. How do we make sure everybody feels like they're learning what they should, nobody feels like they're being snubbed or being ignored. Right? It's basically my job description. And as part of that, how do we make sure that people stay current with the latest methods and tools? Okay? It could be that this toolbox has been developed you know, by a couple of postdocs, it may not be around the next year. How do you know what's actually going to have staying power and what doesn't? Okay, so how do we exercise some judgment on that so we don't waste a lot of time learning something that may not even be updated in a few months? And lastly, how to make sure that the ideas stick. This was something that I started thinking about a lot when I was teaching uh, some workshops last fall. Okay, so I could give uh, you know, a, a lecture like this. I could give some examples. We could work through things you know, during the workshop. But when people then go back to their labs, how, how can I make sure that they're actually able to then apply it to their own data set without having to give too much you know, one-on-one -on -one instruction to everybody? At some point, I just, I just can't. There's, there's too many people, I'm one person, and there are so many hours in the day. Okay, well, here is my latest answer to that. So if you've heard of Andy's Brain blog, this is Andy's Brain book. Not terribly creative, but I mean, partly to show you that they kind of come from the same tree. And I also like the name. So the address, I think you should be able to find it just through a simple Google search of Andy's Brain book, but it's andysbrainbook.readthedocs.io. That should get you to that. And I can send the link after this. Or maybe it was sent out in the announcement as well. I'm not sure. But I'll, I'll send it out. Yeah. If, if we need to. Okay, great. Right, right. Sure, sure. Okay. So the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a demonstration how this works. Again, this is a work in progress. There are a couple of completed uh, self-contained modules that you could already start to get some use from, or at least maybe start to train an RA or uh, a graduate student, somebody who's new to this particular field. So let's start to uh, scroll through this. Let me see here. Do I have... So on the left side here, this is a table of contents that you have at all times, no matter which of these particular links you go into. Helps you keep organized, helps you cross-reference certain topics with other ones. So if, for example, I'm in a Unix tutorial uh, over here, let's say you know, for loops, for example, I can see where I am in that particular chapter. And then if I see something else down the line, which has to do with, say, scripting, which is related to what I'm doing here, I can also go there and see how those two things are related. So when I do this, for some reason, that thing uh, gets put to the side. Well, I guess it's over there. But we'll leave that aside for now. So just know that that's an aspect that's not showing up on this particular screen. But it is there on your own computer. 
OK, so as I'm going through this, uh, let me go back to the main page here. So I have a couple of modules. One is Unix for Neural Imagers. This is a nine-part series. And then an fMRI short course, which has 10 chapters followed by some appendices. So let's start with that. I'll show you a few other things I'm working on. And here's the basic structure. So you can start with the very first chapter in that course. And the basic format of each of these chapters runs something like this. There's some expository text. There are figures, illustrations, screenshots where that seem to be appropriate to guide the reader. And then if we go to, uh, let's see here, something like this, where appropriate, I also start to include exercises to consolidate what the person has learned. So if you already know Unix, this is pretty basic. Somebody who's just starting out, this may be useful. Start to get your feet wet. Start to actually use the commands and get some practical exercise about how to do it. Let's see here. Um, and then, let me just jump ahead to for loops. Um, it's a little difficult to see on the background here, but there are color-coded backgrounds setting off code examples and notes and warnings from the main body of the text, which again helps to keep it more organized and I hope a little bit more comprehensible. At the end of other chapters, if it seems to be appropriate, if it's a particularly, say, complex topic or I think they would benefit from some uh, you know, video walkthrough where I can show them on my computer, you will see that in these video links down here. Okay? And this breaks out to, oops, be quiet. This breaks out to a separate video. This is on my YouTube channel as supplements to what you're learning in the book. You can see this one, it's you know around five minutes. Again, I try to keep these pretty concise. And also, whoops. Go down here. Oh, somebody disliked it. That's not good. There's also a table of, <laughs> who did, who, who was it, who did that? <laughs> not good. There's also a table of contents in each of these videos, which you can use to go to any one of these subtopics. So maybe you already know some of the background. You're just trying to remember something like, uh, there was this animation about how a for loop worked. I liked it. How do I get back to that part as quickly as possible without rewatching the entire thing? So if we do that, you know, we go precisely to that part of it. And then, you know, what, what I try to show here is, okay, you've, you've read a lot about for loops. Maybe you've typed some things out. Let's get a more intuitive understanding how it works so that you understand how this applies to sets of any size. Uh, and also there's a voice over here. I turned it off just so there's not two voices talking. But you can see whatever's in the list at that particular point gets placed into that variable. And then the for loop, this is my conception of it. It runs through one part of the loop, then it goes to the next part in that set, places that in the variable, executes the body of that code, which then produces another loop, and then so on and so forth. So you quickly see how this becomes very useful when you do this with sets of hundreds or thousands, which you know usually we have to do with fMRI analysis. So, and then you know at some point we'll actually show you how to do it on an actual Unix terminal. So you get both the conceptual part and the practical aspect as well. Okay. So that's the basic format of the videos. They're, they're pretty simple to understand. Uh, let me just show a couple other of features that I think might be useful. Also notice, whoops, also notice I, what? I call this uh, Unix for neural imagers, right? So it's not just any Unix tutorial. We do cover the same basics you would learn in any Unix course, but anything I teach, which might be Unix, in the future might be MATLAB, anything else that we deal with on some kind of regular basis, it's geared towards how would you use that with a typical fMRI study. Okay, we're not learning, you know, you know, top uh, other you know more complex Unix commands. Things like maintaining a server may be useful to know at some point, but we're going to eschew those for focusing on the commands you're most likely to come across to analyze your own data and probably see in other people's code as well. 
Yeah, that's the approach I'm taking there. OK. Um, within, say, the fMRI short course, let's go to preprocessing. Uh, so I'm not an egomaniac. I'm just showing an example of how you know you you take you know, like if you take regular pictures, if it looks blurry, kind of kind of not that great, you want to clean it up. And that's the same thing we do with fMRI data. It's just in three dimensions and a little bit more difficult to actually visualize. But in a chapter like this, where preprocessing is a very broad topic, there are sub chapters covering each one of those particular topics. And then. Uh, there's a, in this case, there's a playlist that summarizes everything you did in the previous chapters. Okay, one last thing, I guess feature you could call it. So I'm starting to work on these appendices here uh, to, to kind of supplement what you did in the FSL course. I can't cover the whole FSL course here right now, but suffice it to say, it starts with you download this data set, you know what the experimental paradigm does. Then you do a very basic contrast of something like you know, congruent versus incongruent. Do the second level analysis. Is it where you would expect it to be based on where the original authors found their activation? It's basically like a replication analysis. And then you can use that as a springboard to do more advanced things if you like. Um, so for example, you know, cluster correction, we go into it a little bit more detail here. Talk about why Bonferroni is not exactly that, that good. And then for something like cluster correction, I embed uh, GIFs in some of these tutorials, if it doesn't seem to merit an entirely separate video, to show, uh, oh, it's going really slow for some reason, to show how you can take, uh, say, one slice through the brain tilt it in three dimensions, see it in a slightly different perspective, and then see how a threshold only shows you the peaks of that particular map. And then from the text, you can learn how that's tied up with then running the cluster simulations. Okay, So those are the three main things. So there's the basic text format. There's you know, how you can set off uh, the actual expository text from notes, from code, and so on and so forth. There are actual videos and exercises to consolidate what you've learned. And then in some parts, these brief animations showing you how certain concepts play out over time. You know. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and this actually is part of uh, a larger video, which then shows you Actually, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I do like this one quite a bit, actually. Um, so again, we, we show that same basic thing. Also, you see the U of M watermark that's relatively new. Uh, you know, just to show my Michigan, Michigan pride. Uh, never mind that I used to work at OSU. No, <laughs> whatever. I'm, I've converted. Yeah, I'm over that. Um, let me see here. Again, there's, you know, usually there's background information, but then uh, it explains why, you know, that, that, that threshold you just saw is the cluster defining threshold. It doesn't actually tell you which clusters are significant. To do that, I'm skipping around a little bit, you need to run simulations which look something like this. So let's say these are data sets composed of pure noise, right? So you're on one simulation, you note what the largest cluster is, you keep doing these simulations, they're data sets with the same dimensions and resolution of your original data set. You're just doing these you know, hundreds, thousands of times, and you build up a, a distribution of what these cluster sizes look like. You know, usually they approach something kind of looking like a normal distribution. And if your particular cluster size is over here, is that, you know, beyond that, that cutoff? So they, they do take a long time to, to, to create. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I am looking for currently is a graphic designer to take some of that workload off of my hands. Because I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm happy to do them. But once you've done the first, like, couple hundred, you're like, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't, to, I don't want to do them anymore. So um, I, I did just get a small budget from, from, from John and from Scott 
to, to look into possibly hiring somebody part-time from the, uh, the School of Design. So if anybody knows anybody, because they want me to hire somebody you know, locally who's associated with uh, University of Michigan, please let me know. Or if anybody here happens to be really fluent with Photoshop or Final Cut Pro or Camtasia, also please let me know. Um, I don't know like what the you know restrictions are who I can give the money to. It's it's not really mine, but I can uh, dole it out as needed. Okay. And then last thing about this whole setup. Let's go back to the main page. So that has all so far just covered Unix, fMRI. Again, those modules are relatively complete. I'm still working on a couple parts of the appendices like uh, what are some good principles for creating a figure, right? How to create something that doesn't look uh, amateurish, for lack of a better word. Something that does, doesn't just use the defaults of Excel or R that shows a little bit more thought into how to you know, balance the whole thing, make it a little bit more you know, publication worthy. So that's something else that I'm, I'm working on, mostly by showing examples of how of figures I used to make like way back early in graduate school, which look, well, they're a source of enjoyment uh, at this point. But uh, basically, don't make those same mistakes. OK, so uh, there are a lot of modules under construction. I'll give an example of a few. So there's a free surfer short course. Uh, is Emily Garnett here? OK, she, so uh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, because she's one that I'm working with uh, on this. She has a lot of experience with editing anatomical images, more than I do. Okay, she, she's seen a lot more variation, too, because I've mostly worked just with healthy controls. So as this is expanded to things like free surfer, diffusion, and so on, I'm starting to request people with different specialties to help out with very specialized topics. Um, there's an, uh, an ASL course I'm currently working on with Luis Hernandez Garcia. He's the ASL guru. Um, we're hoping to have something ready by the time of the fMRI course that we can have as a brief introduction to it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to go through each of those, but just be aware that they do exist. Uh, we're still working on it. And then there's, I'm also just beginning an introduction to MR tricks. This is the first drafts of it. Um, hope to have. Free Surfer and MR Tricks done by September. That's the current deadline. And then start to add other stuff like AFNI, SPM, fill in a couple of the gaps there. And for this, <clears throat> uh, does anybody know John Plass? He's a, a postdoc in, in David Brang's lab. So he, he has quite a bit of experience with this. And he's another person I'm working with to, again, fill in the gaps of any of the knowledge that I have. Oh, one last thing I should mention about all this is that in some cases, let me see if I can find, oh, come on, uh, it's probably scripting. Yeah, so we talk about scripting, talk about all this. Uh, so I've also linked this to my uh, GitHub page, so where, appropriate you know, for something like creating a script to analyze this sample FSL data set, you can simply download this thing and then modify it as you need to. It's almost like a template that you can use. And we'll be adding these things uh, more and more in the future. OK, so that is the book. I hope that I've piqued your interest. And I'd like to finish up with a few slides in conclusion. So we just gave the demo of that. So looking forward, possible management structures. Uh, the idea for this whole ebook thing came around the you know turn of the new year as I as I found out that as I'm helping more and more people, I'm getting spread more and more thin. So how do I provide a centralized resource to teach <clears throat> at least some of these lower level concepts, get people on their feet, and also make sure that everybody is being consistent with the terminology. Now, there's certain things like you know runs versus sessions, which you just got to choose one. Not everybody uses them consistently, but I use them in a, in a certain way. But things like you should know what a voxel is. You should know 
what a um, you know, ROI analysis. When we say those things, it should immediately trigger this mental image of what we're talking about to make things more efficient. So possible management structures, as this keeps being developed, how are we going to add new content and maintain it? One is the dictator approach. Okay? Again, this has negative connotations, but let me explain. Uh, I was at OHBM a few weeks ago, and there was one session about the bids format. There was a big discussion about what do we do about bids, how do we update it, because the person who was the main driving force behind it, Chris Gorgalewski, I think I'm saying that right, he took a job with Google about six months ago. He's, I mean, he's still kind of involved, but obviously his main focus is elsewhere. Fair enough. But there's a lot of discussion about who's going to do it because nobody really wants to take on the role of doing everything, right? Which he was mostly doing that. And then there were discussions like, should we do it by committee, by vote? And he got the sense it's probably not going to work. You know, somebody needs to be more or less the person who uh, does most of it. So the opposite end of that spectrum is kind of putting it into a wiki format. So this is on <clears throat> everything that I've written to create those figures you saw in the read the docs, all the text, all the formatting, everything. That is all on uh, my GitHub page. It gets converted. It's all written in Sphinx. It gets converted. And so if you are willing to learn some Sphinx formatting and some Sphinx terminology, you are completely welcome to make edits as you want. Now, I own the repo, so I have to approve the changes. <clears throat> but there's nothing stopping people from doing that. If we wanted to make that a little bit more, like loosen the bonds of that, you could make it more like a wiki approach where anybody basically has the right to, uh, to make edits as they see fit. I've actually never edited a wiki. There may be more to it than that, but that's kind of the basic approach. And you see some of these examples with fMRI analysis floating around on the internet. Uh, the last one, which I'm more inclined to at this point is almost kind of like an editor-in-chief model. So I'll provide the structure, the format, maybe some of the broad strokes things. But if there's a certain specialty which somebody has more experience with, say, you know, Emily with uh, FreeSurfer or John with um, MR tricks, then they can either, you know, write their own <clears throat> specialized pages on that or they can make edits as they see fit. So if there's any particular expertise somebody would like to lend a hand with, please uh, let me know. This, this could be even things like, you know, I, I've really never dealt with clinical patients uh, because it's like really difficult. <laughs> so I just, I just stay away from it because there are a lot of, a lot of things you gotta be on the lookout for. But I think that is something that's gonna be highly in demand. I think it's already highly in demand. If there's a standardized way of dealing with things like lesions or with you know, specialized clinical populations. How do you analyze those particular people? What specific things do you have to keep in mind about? Motion correction, you know, what kind of thresholds are typically used? Um, how do you mask out the lesions and say something like free surfer or even registration with a, a typical fMRI study? No, those things are important too. So if anybody is willing to help out with that, that's something, it's kind of a longer term project, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. Okay. So looking forward, you know, I hope everybody is at least somewhat intrigued by, by the, this new, new resource. Again, there are other ones out there. I'm, I'm by no means claiming I'm the only one. But uh, I do think that this is a unique form, of a, a combination of these you know, illustrations, animations, videos, exercises, GitHub uh, scripts and kind of trying to unify everything into a more systematic structure than I've been doing up until now. It's not just a series of kind of random blog posts that I'd write on whatever was the problem I happened to be dealing with at the time, which is really how it worked for, for several years before you know, it started becoming a little bit more systematic. So as we're doing this, <clears throat> please give me your feedback. Uh, I'd like to know what works, what doesn't seem to work, what you think would be added to or omitted, you know, obviously you can't satisfy everybody. I'm not, I, I can't enact everybody's, you know, uh, suggestions, but the more I have, the more useful it will be. And to get to this point, just to let you know, uh, you know, we started this back in March and then April. 
I was working with a group of graduate students and postdocs, what I thought was you know, a pretty representative sample of you know, people who were working with you know, clinical and more basic research, people who had maybe a year of fMRI experiments or fMRI experience, and people who were going to be starting an fMRI experiment sometime in the next six months. So there was a range. There were people who were totally new, some people who already had a little bit of experience. And every other week we would meet, I would get their feedback on the current chapter I was writing, and then we, we would make some edits based on their suggestions. So we could do a similar uh, procedure here as well. And then I would really like to use this as a platform for future workshops. I think this would be excellent because you're able to then have a resource that people can go back to after they're done with that one or two day workshop that I've given. Right? You can go back, you can look at the scripts again, you can see exactly what we did so there's no uh, miscommunication about what was done. And I think just having that as not a prop really but uh, kind of a background that I can have during the workshop would be very useful as well. It would be more systematic than simply doing you know, straight through a PowerPoint, having people do the steps one at a time. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity here. Again, uh, I, I really do want everybody's feedback, everybody's help with this. I think this is going to be you know, a, a really useful resource for everybody here and also a very useful resource for Michigan and the rest of the neuroimaging community at large. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. So any questions about anything I presented or any of the, the different contributor models that I, I posited? I can go back to any of that. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. yeah, so helpful. Thank you. Well, that's the idea because, again, you know, there are two years where I was flailing around, and I remember it very vividly how it was to, especially which things seems to be the biggest impediments to understanding, even though they really shouldn't be. There's virtue to struggling through things. It really, you don't learn anything unless you struggle a little bit, but there's a certain point where it's diminishing or no returns, and how do we identify that and remove that? as quickly as possible is the goal. Right. right. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's absolutely superb. Thank you. And uh, the, the model of uh, the, this is a book, uh, I think that's powerful. Um, so uh, we had uh, Scott Detell's book. Mm -hmm. Side by side, it's incredibly hard to learn from a textbook. Right. And yeah. this has the right kind of modular structure and images and videos mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it, it somehow you identified, I think, uh, the exact right tool for teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also a search bar. So, you know, you may think, uh, I think this problem it has to do with resampling. You just type in resampling in the search bar it'll return a list of the relevant pages. And their search engine is really good. I tried it out on, I just typed in four, right? And the for loop was the first thing that came up. You know, it didn't just return any page that had the word, word four on it. So it is, it is pretty good. I, I also want to mention, just caveat lector, I, I'm one person, okay? This isn't peer reviewed, really. <laughs> So really, I mean, be, be aware of that. I mean, I, I want people to use it. I want to know about errors and bugs as they come up. But, you know, d don't look at this as like the only resource that's a train new people or to learn about certain topics. There, there are other things out there. Uh, I am just one. This is like my particular take on everything. But people yeah. can give you feedback. That is true, yeah. So then you can make Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I like the kind of Editor-in-chief, editor yeah. yeah. Where you're, you're, you're not, I think making a wiki is, it might get kind of, you go in too many different directions. That's been my experience, yeah. Put a, a composed a very nice, useful format mm -hmm. where people give you feedback. Yeah. And at the same time, you can get the content. Right, yeah. Is there a feedback thing on there? There 
isn't. That's one of the limitations. So there's no comments section. There's no message board. There might be a way to create one, but I don't know how to do that just yet. But I mean, it's been brought up before. It'd be very useful. Um, you know, I do have a comment page on my, my personal website, but it's it, it kind of separate and not that easy to get to. But it would be useful if like, on that particular page you could just make a comment. Um, I suppose you could do that as part of the editing on GitHub if you wanted to. Just send a push notification. I think I'm using the term correctly. But. Can you yeah. a, a resources page on here really, uh, for, for further information? Right. Yeah. Not a separate one. Where it seems to be appropriate, I do link to other pages, other papers that are relevant to the topic okay. being discussed. Um, I really do want to create, like a, say, statistics for neural imagers. I don't want to get too parochial, but just kind of the background that you would need to understand how to do the, these uh, analyses in fMRI, you know, how they work, how they're related to what you learned about the general linear model uh, in college. And also, maybe like a survey of more complicated designs, using them with actual data sets from, say, Open Neuro that lend themselves to, like, you know, from anything from a two by two to a hierarchical design, something like that. Um, they're longitudinal designs that I've seen. So I'd like to get uh, as broad a, a sampling as possible to illustrate each of those things. For now, I just, I just punt and I say, for more information about the general linear model, go to, you know, stats off or something like that. Yeah. I, I, I could still be useful because if people want to you know, read more they right. ask questions and, and, and since you've been kind of covering this, this field or yeah. looking at all the different, you know, many different uh, resources out there, you've got a good sense of kind of what's good and what's not. And right. I think recommendations about mm -hmm. what people can do, I think that would be yeah. also very yeah. helpful. Are you going to integrate this or is there a plan to integrate this into the fMRI Summer FMRI course? Not right now. Um, you know, it's relatively new. Um, I, I have shown it to John and to Scott. To uh, it was just a couple weeks ago that I I introduced them to it. So I, I would definitely like to at some point. Not this year though. I think it's too soon. Um, and they're also using SPM, which I don't have a walkthrough on so far. I do have kind of higher level things about. Okay, here's what smoothing does. Here's why you would do it. Here's some cases where you wouldn't do it. Here's what too much is. Here's what too little is, depending on your particular question. So in that case, it is generalizable. But for now, what I have it on right now is focused mostly on how you do it in FSL. Uh, so it's not that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Extensible yet. Uh, <laughs> just give me a couple weeks. You know. um, that's always been in the back of my mind, but it, it does come down to time constraints. So if, if there is somebody who has <clears throat> expertise in that and they have a really good uh, demonstration data set that people can use to get their feet wet. So that, you know, there's no cost. You don't need to collect your own data set. Just do it on this example. Think about it. See, how, see what's involved. See how easy it is, maybe how easy it is. And then that might impel you to then collect your own uh, to do it that way. But at this point, I mean, you know, EEG is something that I'd love to do, something like this, same format on. But the, the truth is I probably just don't have the time to, to, to go into it in any, any real depth beyond the basics. But it's a good question. Uh, are there other examples of books on other topics that were done like uh, kind of. So the, impul the, the impetus for this, so I'd had this kind of in the back of my mind. I had been making drafts in you know, Google Docs. I was thinking, like, I'm going to put this in like a giant PDF, and there will be links embedded in it. But it was uh, in early March, I went to Luisa's ASL workshop. And somebody gave a demonstration about how to use their particular ASL analysis software package. And they had to read the docs format. So it wasn't gigantic or anything. But I really just liked the layout. I liked the format. It was easy to read, easy to follow. 
and that was what I then used to to do this. So if you go to, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the exact name, Oxford Publications or something like that. I think they do have some links to similar type of projects, but not, not on this scale. Yeah. Because I'm thinking that everything should be cognitive. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. There's no reason that I agree, yeah. I teach intro to cognitive science. Mm -hmm. I'm now inspired to get started on the, the key material that gets repeated again and again yeah. and put it into this format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, well, now that I think more, Luke Chang did something similar with, it was an intro to machine learning. Really? I'll have to dig that up. Yeah. Um, kind of a similar, it's not in Read the Docs, but it's a similar kind of format. Yeah. yeah. So, Andy, you showed the uh, link, uh, some pages from the Batman. Uh, oh, yeah. Analysis. Yeah. So, Yeah, an ex yeah. What I'd love to do. So I actually I, I used her her Batman tutorial f to to learn a lot of the mm -hmm. basics about MR tricks. So I, I was using that in this talk as a contrast of what I thought wasn't you know as uh, organized an approach. Right. Um, but I should probably get in touch with her and just say you know I'd love to transcribe this you know in, in so many words to this kind of format and like give her total credit for. You know, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the the layout. If it's something that's really good, yeah, that it's useful instead of like reinventing the wheel, it might be helpful to, for you to maybe partner with her. Yeah, yeah, like for sure, yeah. Sending it up and being able to, to link. Yeah. I mean, show some of your really cool videos. Yeah, that yeah. Might be helpful for mm -hmm. the future. Yeah. Uh, I can send updates when you know another major module is completed, such as Free Surfer or MR Tricks, just so everybody can be kept kept abreast of that. Um, I do have like a running note at the very bottom saying uh, this thing was completed this time, this thing was completed this other time. But aside from that, it's not totally clear what was updated when. So, you know, when there's a major event, like I think that something is now ready to be used, I can just send that out to the entire. Let's serve. Yeah. Okay, well, we're a little past time. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you.